Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, first, on behalf of NS Blue Scope Malaysia and NS Blue Scope Lights Up Malaysia, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar. Um, I also would like to thank uh, Dr. Lam for giving us the opportunity to speak at this uh, webinar. My name is Santa. I'm the marketing specialist of NS Blue Scope Lights Up Malaysia. And today we have Rocky Shade, Doc Technical Marketing Engineer at NS Blue Scope Malaysia, and James Ng, Business Development Manager at NS Blue Scope Lights Up Malaysia, who will be the presenters for today's webinar. So in these presentations, we will be sharing you on two topics. Topic number one, selection of quoted steel in different projects. And topic number two will be what are the, uh, the what are the factors to be considered in designing a metal roof. So just a little housekeeping before we get started. So please mute your speaker when you are not speaking. This is to, this prevent, is to prevent background noise from being heard. So should you have any questions, you can enter your question in the chat box. So later we will bring them up during the Q&A sessions. Thank you for your cooperation. So now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to Rocky. Rocky, please. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, uh, Santa, for the introduction. Um, so uh, before we start, let me just highlight the topic for, for me today. It will be a selection of code that's still in different projects. Um, the topic today will be focusing on about a different environment uh, classification which I'll uh, later on show some example. So of course, before we start, uh, let me just show you another uh, video where, uh, I mean, a fellow uh, master students, right? You guys, uh, you know, can, can, you know, promote this as well as, uh, you know, be participating in, in this competition. So it's called uh, Blue Scope Young Architect uh, Award. And this will be the video. Yeah, so it's a short video to, to introduce you, uh, you know, Blue Scope, we are actually hosting this uh, Young Architect Award where uh, we are actually, uh, you know, uh, allowing all the students to actually submit their design and, uh, you know, participate in this, uh, you know, competition. So if you're interested, uh, feel free to go to our website and, you know, um, look at the criteria and also how you can actually uh, be part of this uh, competition. All right. So without further ado, let me just uh, get into my topic. So uh, we know that, you know, Malaysia, you know, we are segregated, you know, in, into two different islands. And uh, of course we have peninsula as well as, uh, you know, both the Borneo side. And um, this location itself is very, you know, quite, quite uh, common in terms of the climate and, and quite consistent in terms of, you know, it's being a tropical climate and uh, most of the time, you uh, you know have rained throughout the year. Um, based on statistics, it shows that you know eighty percent of the days, uh, throughout one year is actually a rainy day, and uh, because of that, uh, it actually is uh, very conducive for a lot of metals as, as well as steel to start corroding because of uh, the the you know existence of moisture, as well as uh, you know very uh, you know a strong, no uh, what do you call it? uh, climate cycle. So um, aside from that, also because we are, you know, a, a basically a coastal uh, country where we have, uh, you know, part of it being a rural inland uh, area and uh, most part of it will be uh, near the marine as well as, uh, you know, a large, a small portion of it will be the industrial uh, area. So all these uh, three areas will have different level of influence on uh, building and especially on your external cladding. So of course, uh, today's topic will will be uh, focusing more on uh, cladding as well as uh, you know steel. So um, typically, if let's say you see a building that looks like this, uh, you know, or even some other building components that look like this, where you have uh, you know small signs of corrosion, right? Not just happening on cladding, but also on other steel components like you know brackets or even a shutter door. So all these 
components itself uh, is actually you know uh, showing sign of rusting because of all this prevalent uh, natural uh, fact like you know rain uh, like you know seawater as well as industrial emissions so um, with that you know uh, there's a, a way to actually uh, there was a, a standard developed to actually um, identify how corrosive is the environment all right so um, that's why you know I mean with all this sea and industrial you know yeah. we need to know what makes the world corrosive so uh, today's topic I'll just bring you through briefly on these four four points of course I'll keep it brief because you know it's a Saturday and uh, you know I would like to keep it simple. So, um, of course, the first one is called ISO 9223, which is a uh, established standard internationally to evaluate how corrosive is a location or an environment. So, uh, later I'll bring you through briefly. Okay. And aside from that, also, um, I'll talk about, you know, accelerated weathering tests, uh, how does it differ from sample exposure tests? And lastly, what's the importance of project case studies? Okay, so on to the first point, uh, ISO 9223. So this document itself is quite comprehensive, uh, but I would just like to condense it down to uh, the intention or the scope of this standard. So as you can see from here, top right corner, the scope of it, this international standards is actually to establish uh, you know, a classification system for the corrosivity of atmospheric uh, environment where you know the the diff there will be different criteria to to you know differentiate or um, how corrosive is an environment. So I just condense it to three points. So the first point is time of wetness and temperature and humidity complexity. Okay. So what this means is that you know if let's say a uh, uh, a location just like Malaysia is a tropical location has a lot of rain. And uh, constantly throughout the year is you know high temperature environment. Then this kind of environment is very conducive for uh, metals to rust much more faster or corrode much more faster compared to uh, a lot of other regions because of the time of wetness. Uh, another point where you influence the corros uh, corrosivity of a, a location would also be the type of atmosphere. So uh, over here we are talking about you know whether the building is near the sea or whether it is far far inland okay so uh, the difference is that you know if let's say it's near the sea then you have more of these uh, you know salt uh, particulates that is accumulating on the surface and you know promoting uh, corrosion reaction so this will also affect the corrosivity of a, a location the third one will be the pollution level so this will be more related to uh, the industrial area, All right? So different industries uh, can emit different levels of industrial emit, uh, uh, pollutants. And of course, uh, you know, uh, being a developing countries, uh, there are a lot of things that are not uh, being regulated or not regulated well enough. So you still have a large uh, amount of the industry still emitting all these corrosive or pollutants uh, to the surroundings. So this will be all the uh, things that we'll be uh, covering. So uh, with all that uh, being considered into uh, you know, the factor, then we can actually uh, tell whether the environment is uh, very corrosive, which is CX or C5 in this case, uh, you know, under these standards, or it is like far inland away from all this corrosivity, which is like C1 or C2, right? So. But generally, for Malaysia, I would say you know we are located, you know, central. I mean, near the sea and all that, and industrial. Then will be normally classified C three or even C four near the near the sea, right? So, um, and these are all the pollutants that you actually uh you know need to consider before you actually can classify the environment as uh, C two or C three or C four. So uh, the, the, the prominent one would be uh, sulfur dioxide, right, which is typically emitted from all these, uh, you know, oil and gas uh, industries or even uh, you know, certain plants, right, that runs on uh, gasoline or diesel. So all these would uh, 
this this kind of process will actually emit a lot of sulfur dioxide, and uh, it, which in turn uh, would actually cause uh, what we call acid rain. So it depends on the the amount of sulfur dioxide emitted from uh, one industry and collectively in a location to determine whether the location itself is uh, more of an industrial area or more of an urban area or rural area, right? So uh, among others will also be nitrogen dioxide, which also is emitted by uh, traffic, so uh, linked to gasoline and all that. And the third one would be, uh, most prominent one would be uh, chloride uh, ion. Chloride ion is basically, uh, you know, mostly uh, related to say for example ocean right sea con condition a uh, sea salt uh, sea uh, sea water condition or even sometimes like uh, nowadays we have a lot of glove industries those uh, locations would actually emit a lot of chloride ions which could actually severely de uh, you know deteriorate the, the building itself but again uh, as you can see from here there are a lot of chemicals uh, that are being covered but uh, Realistically or practically, you know, uh, we cannot really measure uh, how much of these pollutants are being uh, exposed to in, in one location because of lack of resources as well as, uh, you know, lack of the, the you know, expertise uh, locally to do so, right? So that's why, you know, this is a least realistic way of uh, classifying the, the environment in different locations. Of course, it's good to actually use this as a guideline to uh, classify different locations, but it's not really that pr uh, practical in our in our con context. So that's why uh, you know a lot of people, uh, especially industries or manufacturers, would turn to accelerated weathering tests to develop their uh, products, right? So uh, one or, or to show the products can last in certain environment. So one of those uh. uh Test would be called accelerated weathering test. So accelerated weathering tests uh, can be actually uh, done in house or say inside the the lab, right? Uh, and it can be testing on different aspects of the product, like salt spray test, QUV, which tests for the paint durability, uh, castanic uh, SO2, I mean uh, sulfur dioxide test, which tests for acid rain, uh, you know, durability and uh, say Cleveland humidity test, which tests for whether the product can last in certain humid environment. All right, so uh, all these uh, tests, right, it has one thing in common. It will actually put the sample or the product inside the chamber, right? Typically it's a chamber and uh, it will simulate so-called uh, the, the natural environment as close as possible. To, to actually accelerate the, the weathering or the, the deterioration of the product. So this in, in turn will actually show you uh, how durable is the material in uh, you know, actual weather. But this is uh, not the most reliable way because uh, as based on our experience, sorry, uh, based on our experience, um, you know, this test itself will actually show you uh, different uh, results uh, if let's say you use different type of products. So um, in a way, we have to explore uh, more realistic uh, results uh, from here. So that's why uh, this, the second option of sample exposure test comes in. Right. So I'll show you uh, what is the difference between sample exposure and how is it uh, different from uh, accelerated weathering test. Right. So. Um, so accelerated weathering test is done, like I say, in the lab, but um, sample exposure test is normally done in actual weather, meaning it will, we will actually set up a rack uh, facing certain direction and, and having a certain degree of uh, placement and uh, just place the sample there uh, to, to be exposed for uh, you know X amount of years. So typically, if let's say we were to compare accelerated weathering tests with, uh, you know, the actual uh, natural weathering test or sample exposure test, the duration for accelerated test would be somewhere around uh, you know three three months to six months. Uh, then you get a result whether it's reliable or not. We don't know, right? So for 
natural weathering test or sample exposure test, that one, uh, I mean, this one will be more on uh, the duration of three years to 10 years, right? So uh, in a way, we need to spend more resources on the, this uh, sample exposure test, right? So, but the, the, the advantage of this uh, sample exposure test is that it will actually show you much more realistic uh, uh, results, okay? Because uh, it is no longer a simulation where, you know, you don't just limit a certain exposure of certain, uh, you know, uh, pollutants or certain condition. So over here, you can see that, you know, uh, the, the samples that is placed in different environment, okay, uh, C2, C3, and C4, gets a different uh, weathering effect, all right? So uh, for, for Blue Scope, we actually have, uh, we have spent uh, a lot of resources on, on all these exposure sites, right? We actually have a lot of exposure sites in Australia, actually. And also in uh, Malaysia, we have an exposure site in our factory, right? I mean, next to our factory. So, um, the, so this is a more severe one, C4, which it will be placed next to the C. So you can see uh, samples here will actually be normally be very severely corroded, or sometimes you can see sign of corrosion starting on the edge, right? So uh, why we actually do this test is because we actually want want uh, want to see the realistic results of the samples, and uh, how from here you can actually uh, you know use this to uh, do your uh, product selection, right? Or quarter steel uh, material selection is you look at uh, after it's been exposed in uh, say C site. If let's say you have a project near C, then you look at uh, how this sample has been performing uh, near C4 environment. Okay, so here you can see that after only um, less slightly less than four years, uh, this sample ha has been corroded very badly. Okay, so this uh, sample itself has a uh, certain specifications uh, that today we won't get into specifics, but you can see from here compared to accelerated test, it actually fares closer to one type of accelerated test than the other. Okay, so um, here it shows you that you know it sometimes can be inconsistent in uh, if let's say for example a uh, manufacturer they show you this result. Uh, if let's say you buy into this, yeah, the idea of uh, say this accelerated result, then uh, you use the material in actual and your actual building, then you get this result. Then it will be very, uh, it's not matching in terms of the, the result that you get on the paper and the result that you get on actual building. That's why uh, we emphasize on the natural exposure test. So this is another example where you can see a good product that is exposed in the same environment uh, under C4 for almost four years, no sign of corrosion. And uh, here you can see the accelerated test result. One shows uh, you know, worse results than the other, right? If you look at here, this one seems to be better, right? The uh, so-called Osprey test result seems to be better, but in actual, it does not perform as well. And this one, the Osprey test seems to be worse, but then in actual, it performs much better, All right? So that is the downfall of accelerated test or accelerated weathering tests, where the test result itself might not necessarily uh, represent the actual performance, which is the crucial one that you need to know, right? So um, that's why, you know, the reason why we, we started to do more of the accelerated tests is because of this. So one of the common uh, accelerated tests is called salt spray test, which is commonly used uh, still in Malaysia to uh, you know portray uh, you know weatherability of uh, you know a coated steel or of a metal. But uh, again, as you can see from here, it does not actually show the actual uh, result in real life. All right. So as a result of that, you get uh, products that fail prematurely, even though on paper, they promise you, you know, it can be X amount of years. And um, this can be very detrimental, not just to, you know, uh, the, the people who purchase this material, but also to, uh, you know, people who actually specify it. Because 
the reason why you specify it's because you know it's going to be performing well. But if let's say it doesn't, then you are in jeopardy. You are the one in, in the hot seat, right? So uh, that's why you know we emphasize on a more realistic uh, way of judging what kind of quota steel to use. All right. But of course, ultimately, uh, we would actually go to the project case studies. So of course, before this, uh, let me just um, ask you these questions uh, where actually this is a polling question that we would like to you know get more uh, answer from you guys as you know architects. So uh, do you think uh, you can differentiate between uh, you know pro project reference and um, project case studies? So um, Santa. So uh, I'm, I'm sure that on your screen, uh, there's these uh, forms uh, that's uh, posted. So uh, I'll give you one minute to actually answer this question. So can you differentiate between project reference and project case study? Right. So it has uh, something to do with what uh, you know the, the market is practicing. And I guess uh, something that we need to be aware of, um, you know, what is the difference before we actually go down or drill down deeper into uh, you know, looking at what type of quota steel should you use and all that. So, um, yeah, I'll give you one minute. So, So yeah, I, I guess uh, most of you has uh, uh, a 50-50 understanding of uh, what is the difference between project reference and project case study. Okay, so uh, let me just move on. Okay, so let me just show you an example of reference or project reference. So what you can see here is project reference. Okay, it means um, once the project is completed, uh, when you hand over, right, this is where you take a photo, right? So this kind of photo is actually, uh, I mean, it can be used uh, to show you that, you know, how good a workmanship uh, the, the contractor is or even the installer is. But um, if let's say you were to ask yourself whether this can tell me whether the product can last long, uh, my answer is no, right? So most often in, in the industry, um, I think, a lot of manufacturers would like to show you, okay, uh, this is these are the projects that I have completed, right? And, and I have delivered in terms of, uh, you know, my my products and so on. But um, does it actually tell you the, the story about, you know, whether the material can last or, or shows you that, you know, what they promise is true? Uh, my answer is no, right? So for Cota Steel, the value proposition or, or so far, the, the value of this quota steel is always on durability, whether it's on uh, durability against a corrosion or durability against color uh, fading, right? So if I show you another photo, right? So I can say, oh, this is actually a project reference by Blue Scope, but it does not tell you a story about, you know, how, uh, how long this uh, building or this material can last in actual weather, right? So that's why uh, from Blue Scope, we actually uh, invest more in, in uh, you know, case studies. So what I mean by case studies, right? So it means after the building has been there for say X amount of years, then we go back and, and do a, you know, uh, another study and, uh, you know, taking more photos and evidence that the product itself can actually deliver as per promise, as per what we, uh, specified or, or stated on our brochures. So um, again, it comes down to uh, against, uh, I mean, for durability, against corrosion and against uh, color fading, right? So uh, some of the examples that you'll see over here, right? So this, this project itself is actually based in South Africa. So um, of course, um, the more information that we get from these uh, case studies, uh, the more credible it will be because, you know, we know how much, uh, uh, I mean, we, we know who do we refer back to uh, in terms of uh, in case there was any issue and all that. So um, 
we even note down who are the architects and, and uh, when was it produced and so on, or when was it installed. So all these are actually in our database. So, um, <clears throat> so in this case, the, the hotel was actually erected uh, and completed in uh, June of 2013. And uh, just early of this year, we actually went back to actually did a study. Right. So uh, this uh, profile itself was actually Cape Lock profile and uh, it was using actually color bond steel in uh, off-white color. Okay, so all these are actually in our record. So another thing that we uh, noticed and uh, note was that uh, the building is actually certified uh, Green Star. Uh, this is a green building uh, certified by Green Building Council in uh, South Africa. So it's actually a highest uh, rated uh, green building uh, hotel in South Africa. So as you can see, overall, the, the cladding itself is still in good condition. And one thing uh, I would note is that, you know, uh, normally in case studies, we will actually bring an original color, right, color sample uh, to the site to compare it visually side by side, how it fares uh, compared to the original color. So you can see from this top, uh, bottom right corner, the original color versus the uh, actual uh, roof. So white color itself, you know, in South Africa is quite common for roof. Uh, the reason why is because uh, they use it for uh, to to reduce the roof temperature because they have you know quite large amount of uh, sunlight exposed uh, to the building. So uh, you can see the color change uh, quite little and. Um, fortunate enough, we also have the original photo when it was just completed and we actually took another one once, uh, you know, I mean, once the uh, building was completed, we took one photo and when we did the case study, we took another one to show you a side by side visual. Right. So, yeah, it's quite straightforward. Also, uh, normally when we do case studies, we don't just look at one aspect of the product, meaning the performance, but we also look at how it actually performs with other components. So um, I think nowadays uh, you guys are more familiar with, like, say, a solar panel array, right? Like how to install it and so on. So um, this actually was pushed by you know the government to actually have more solar panels installed onto the roof uh, to to have a net uh, energy neutral or more of the green energy, right? So when we actually see, saw that trend and then we uh, actually uh, search for buildings uh, with uh, solar panels. So to, to actually the, the study was actually to, to look at how the material can uh, perform well with uh, different types of solar panels uh, array or systems and what are the things to note for, right? So in this case, uh, the hotel itself uh, had a solar pa panel array and um, the manager building manager uh, himself actually told us that you know they didn't actually maintain the, the solar panels so uh, what comes after you know the installation was that there was a lot of uh, you know what they call excrement from say birds uh, around they were flying around and, and settling on the roof so uh, as a result you get all this uh, accumulation of excrement right so uh, this is uh, why we actually uh, would, would always highlight, you know, uh, what we call unwashed area uh, for, for, you know, um, building owner to take note. So uh, in South Africa, fortunately, all this bird excrement itself uh, will not cause any uh, harm. But for, uh, say, in Malaysia, if let's say you have all these excrement settling on your roof, then uh, it will actually, uh, you know, start corroding the roof. Okay, so that's why it's very important for you to, you know, know all this. So we know all this by, you know, conducting the case studies. Okay, so another thing is, um, say vegetation, because of all this dirt accumulation and all, the, all this excrement, it brought up all this, uh, you know, vegetation onto the gutter. Right. So some examples. So, so we do a lot of case studies. So this is another one where it was actually uh, placed next to uh, uh, quite quite a strong uh, sea breeze. So you can see it's actually 
uh, within marine influence. Okay. So over here, we actually compared side by side with another type of product, uh, typically in market, we call them PPGI. Okay. So uh, the building that we uh, inspected, uh, which was using our color bond steel, uh, was actually uh, aged eight and a half years over. So you can see overall, there was no sign of corrosion. And we actually went next uh, to the building. There was another building. It was uh, supplied with uh, PPGI. And you can see after five years, this is uh, the sign of uh, napping corrosion and uh, end napping corrosion that we saw. So here it shows you that, you know, uh, the, the salt spray test that I showed you earlier, it might not be realistic to, to be a judging criteria. So the best way actually is to look at the case studies. Okay. So to be more in depth, so this is the building and yeah, close up. Yeah. And this is another building uh, in Labon. So it was also using uh, you know, uh, Ultra, Calabon Ultra and uh, near the marine area. So uh, fortunate enough for certain uh, cases, we will have you know original photo when it was just completed. So this photo alone will be considered as a reference project reference or. But if let's say you have you know a photo of it after, then you can actually compare side by side and tell you that okay this is you know after ten years and this is how it performs and that information itself is what we call project case study. Right, and um, that is what gives uh, you know the the credibility to the material, okay, or to the whatever product that uh, you know the manufacturer are selling, okay. And of course, uh, you know, uh, the the case study list doesn't just cover buildings that are you know near near sea or near you know uh, uh, uh an urban area, but also in the industrial uh, area. So this uh, is an uh, absorber factory. So uh, we did the uh, case studies end of last year. So at that point of time, the roof was there for uh, over 22 years okay, using color point. So of course, over here straight away, we saw uh, by flying over the drone, you can see that there was actually uh, some kind of deposits so uh, we actually uh, climb up to the roof and found out that the deposits itself is actually some sort of powder uh, emitted from the, the roof. Okay. And it was not actually washed away easily by uh, rainwater because it was there for more than 20 years. So it was already accumulating quite, quite a lot of the powder. Right? But uh, away from the chimneys or from these, all these uh, industrial uh, emission, we saw there was actually a quite a, a vast area where it was not really contaminated, but you can see, uh, you know, we actually brought an original sample, right? And we compared to not just the this, uh, general surface, but we compared to the crest of the profile as well as the web of the profile. So over here, what you can see is that, you know, the crest of the profile is normally, uh, you know, more weathered off, but uh, compared to the web of the profile, the web of the profile is still in, in, in good condition. But again, um, this is after 22 years. So you can imagine you know, how the material can perform even beyond that. Right? So aside from just the color, but we also, also, we also look at the corrosion performance. So typically one of the ways to do that is actually look at the cut edge, cut edges or so-called lab edges. So if let's say the lab edges are showing no sign of corrosion, that means it's actually a good sign that the material can actually last quite a long uh, while and it can still uh, provide uh, longer durability from there on. So uh, aside from that, we also observe uh, this uh, copper lightning arrester or copper lightning uh, conductor. So um, this actually inform us that you know uh, the the effect of uh, what we call bimetallic corrosion between copper and steel or even copper and zinc and copper and aluminium. Uh, the fact that um, copper is uh, you know more noble in terms of the carbonic series uh, makes it you know uh, not corrode 
but it will actually induce steel to start corroding. So this is uh, one of the findings and one of the proof that we can show always to tell the story that you know it should not use copper lightning conductor, but opt for something else like aluminum lightning conductor. So all in all, uh, the summary is that you know instead of uh, using the accelerated weathering test like salt spray, you should opt for sample exposure test or even even better, you should opt for the projective studies. If let's say you want to evaluate whether a product of or coated steel is able to be supplied to uh, your types of project or your type of environment. So with that, uh, I would like to conclude uh, my session and hand it over to James. Hi, morning, everyone. Uh, I'm James from Lightside. Uh, just hold on for a second. Okay, let me show. Uh, everyone can see? Yes. Thanks. Yes. Uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this uh this session. Okay. I'm sure most of you all actually heard about uh blue scope light side before. Okay. Uh, the reason why we actually uh conduct this session is actually to to let the designer know actually what is the design consideration, what you should actually take note when you design a metal roof. Or metal cladding. So basically, I think uh, Rocky has already explained all the detail, all the detail and all the uh, all the information that uh, Rocky need to highlight, especially on the material warranty and the coating. So my session will be more towards on to the detailing, how you finish up uh, your detail at the at the window opening, door opening, uh, apron slab, and so on. Okay. So this is the agenda that I'm going to share. First of all, the roofing profile selection. Uh, you need to select uh, the profile. Okay. Then second of all is actually is the rainwater runoff. Because as you can see, actually, uh, metal roof, there's a different height of it. So uh, rainwater discharge is very important in designing a metal roof system. So third one will be the gutter and downpipe sizing. Fourth will be sound and heat, expansion, contraction, uh, this also applies to all the building material, it expand and contract. Six is accessory, seven detailing, eight is specification and floor decking and good installation practice. Okay. So normally when you actually uh, come out uh, for your practice as an architect or as a designer, uh, first client will ask you actually, uh, when you design, use metal roof, okay, uh, they'll ask you noisy or not. First question. Second question, whether it's hot or not. And third question will be, uh, how long does it can last? So uh, these are the answer to your question. First, uh, noisy or not, it depends on the system that you use. Uh, what kind of like a broad wool or insulation glass wool that you use? Second, the foil uh, and what kind of level of the uh, foil that you want, heat transmission. And third one basically will based on actually a uh, uh, rocky product, which is uh, either you use Colorbond, Ultra or uh, Spectrum model product. Okay. So they actually will provide certain years of warranty. So to get a uh, more detail or more accurate warranty, uh, if you can, if you possible, you actually can email us the type plan so that okay will confirm a uh, exact warranty or roughly a warranty to you that 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 warranty that commit how many years. Okay. So in metal roofing selection of the profile, we have two type. One is the pierce fixing, one is the conceal fixing. Okay. So pierce fixing, you will see all the screw puncturing to the roof, then conceal fixing, you will see all the all the clips on it. Okay, all the clips onto the roof, then this one will just clip it on. So you wouldn't see any uh, fastener on top. Okay, so there's two types of installation. For the roof, actually, normally we will install the screw onto the rib here, the head here. Okay, why the reason is because this part for the roof, actually, they will collect water. So we don't install our fastener at this area. So we we'll install onto the top, just for the roof. 
for the wall cladding, normally uh, this profile can be used in wall cladding. So uh, for the wall cladding, we install onto the valley here. This one called valley. So why we install here is actually first, uh, the school doesn't need to use the longer school. Second, actually this actually will direct school to your subframe or structure or wall group. Okay. So in metal roof also, uh, uh, we can done all kind of design. Okay, especially uh, those uh, soft grade steel mat uh, material. So we need to check your radius. That's the reason why most of our technical people will ask you, what is your radius curvature? Or what, uh, whether is it curve on plan or curve in elevation? So this is to determine that what kind of profile is suitable for your design. We are not like uh, just like uh, other, 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 other supplier, which is uh, just give you a proposal for the for the purpose of selling it. We actually want you to know that when you use this product, there's a reason why you use this product and why you use this profile and what is the function, what is the advantage of this profile and what is disadvantage of this profile. Because every profile has uh, their own characteristic. Like each of person of us, we have our own characteristic, we have own, our own attitude, our own character. So that's why it same goes to uh, metal group profile. So they have their own characteristic. Some profile that cannot be curved, some profile can be curved, some profile can go down to uh, 0.42 or 0 0.40 thickness, some profile cannot, it must be in 0.48 and 0.6 thickness. So that's actually the reason of it. Uh, as we go along, actually, uh, I will explain what is the characteristic that commonly each profile has. Okay. So like this example, this is the rainwater runoff. Uh, the reason why you need to know this data is because uh, the discharge of the water, okay. <coughs> Sorry, Cape Block Optima is the uh, is a cap system. Uh, we have the higher rate of uh, higher rate of the profile. Span that is the second uh, second highest. Uh, trim deck and followed by trim deck. So basically, you can see this is actually rainfall intensity. So normally in Malaysia, normally we use three hundred to four hundred. So for southern case, we normally use four hundred. For northern case, also we use 400 and Tenggano side, also we use 400. So uh, this is to determine the drainage of the water. Okay, why I say that is actually every method that pan here, there's actually a height. Okay, this pan here actually will collect the rainwater. So imagine your slope is 2 degree or 1 degree pitch. You slope very gentle uh, slope down to your gutter. This water level will discharge to your gutter be slow if you have a long land roof let's say you have 50 meter of roof for a factory so or 100 meter of roof for a factory so this water will discharge uh, let's say two degree pitch will discharge the water very slow so when very slow when it rains heavily so this water will accumulate fast so when you accumulate fast this water actually where does it go you would actually overflow to the site so when you overflow to the site so when this part we over the site you actually slope inside the building so if you don't discharge the uh, water as soon as possible to the gutter. So basically, I can say that metal roof is the drainage, the small drain. Okay, uh, Gutter is the big drain. So the big drain will actually uh, collect more rainwater. Okay? So you need this small drain to drain out the water as soon as possible to the big drain, which is your gutter. So the same goes to uh, spandex. This is the spandex. You can see the rip height is actually 24 mm. and is very small so water might slip through uh, to the side lapping okay if you use the design like for example 3 degree pitch uh, uh, rainfall intensity is 300 mm per hour okay so if you use a uh, cape lock you can go up to 115 uh, meter means from the ridge from the top to the uh, gutter there you can use 150 meter so let's say imagine spend that you can only use for 20 meter and for trim that about 45 meter only so uh, as you go higher, this rib, okay, this head here, you go higher, the better on the drainage. So basically, uh, for long land roof, you always suggest to use either cape lock or zip deck. Later, I'll show you one, so one of the profile, okay. So selection profile is very important. So for example, like if you select a uh, trim deck, sometimes uh, your design is about uh, 100 meter length of roof. So definitely for trim deck, uh, you cannot use in 2 degree pitch. So normally what we do is you want to go 100, okay, you can go higher, higher pitch, which is 75 meter, 
uh, length of road, you need to go up, up to 10 if you pitch. So let's say if you're 100 meter long of road, it's the best choice you still need to choose Cape Lock Optima as a profile selection. Okay. So on top of that, we will actually uh, guide you all to, uh, to estimate what is the girth size of your gutter. So why you need to know this information is actually uh, when you know the girth size of your gutter, uh, the height of your gutter, everything, you know how to detail uh, on the facial part. Facial part, that means the edge here. Uh, we are sorry. Oh, facial part, that means this edge. Okay, this part edge. So when you have, imagine you're stopping this side. So you have a gutter here. You need to detail this height of the, this height of the edge. How you detail. This will determine by your concealed gutter, what is the height. Okay. So let me go back to the slide, sorry. Okay, so this is one of the information. So the width of your cutter also uh, will based on this spreadsheet, we will determine what's the width, so whether it will actually affect your trusses or your steel structure member or not, or you will actually clash with your steel structure member. So on top of that, we will provide the number of down pipe, what is the sizes, so that you know uh, what is the size of the column uh, to design so that you can encase your downpipe into your column instead of uh, putting side by side. You will make your, I mean, your aesthetic wise look ugly. Some uh, some designers don't like to put downpipe just right beside our column. They want to put and encase it into column. So when they need to encase it, they need to know what is the column size, whether 200 by 200 or 400 by 400 or circular size, let's say uh, 500 diameter. So this is the information. So let's say imagine your downpipe is 200 mm diameter. Of course, your your circular column you need to go for maybe four hundred diameter instead of going to two hundred. So if you put two hundred, you just put uh just right sizes, then you do have a tolerance mm to actually to uh to put uh to give the maintenance guy to maintain your downpipe. So you need certain uh, allowance for your column to let the maintenance guy to uh, either hack it a little bit or open a little bit to, to maintain your uh, downpipe. Let's say your downpipe is choke up. Okay, so that's the reason why we provide this uh, downpipe sizes. Okay, so basically in uh, the design wise, uh, people will ask me one question, which one is actually have a very high risk. So if you have a butterfly roof, what I say is butterfly roof is two sides slope to the one gutter, which is the concealed gutter. This kind of uh, design is called butterfly roof. So we, if we have butterfly roof, I mean, there is actually a high risk because you are actually collecting two catchment area. This roof on your right side catchment area and this roof on your left side. The roof catchment area, the amount of water joined together into one gutter and maybe five number of dump pipe that share. So this is a high risk because you have to de de uh, detail out your gutter to be sufficient enough to cater for two catchment area, whether the left and right together add on, what is the area? So uh, I would say that the best design still goes to the external gutter. You get this gutter away from your building line, okay, or your setback, uh, your building line. That's the better choice, or your wall. So that when your gutter choke up or your duct pipe choke up, you actually can access and clean it. This one, uh, if leaking happens, you actually will leak, uh, will leak into the building, either into your RC wall in the middle or your brick wall in the middle, if you have a uh, butterfly roof, okay? So not to say it cannot be done, it can be done, but proper uh, detailing or proper design, have to design for your gutter, especially on your gutter. You have to get prepared, let's say, uh, the leaf that choke up the, the opening of the downpipe, okay? Uh, what is the secondary backup plan? Uh, let's in case this water would, uh, this downpipe choke up. So you need to at least have sufficient uh, down pipe or sufficient uh, gutter width or height. So that's the thing. So for example, let's say in this design, you design two number only down pipe. Okay. Then, but in the calculation, you, you uh, calculate for you, ask you to provide two number. So please don't design just two number. Allow additional one more number as a backup plan, just in case one, one down pipe choke up, you got another secondary down pipe to back you up to discharge the water. That's the reason. So normally, uh, we'll put one number extra up uh, when we design a calculation. Let's say, for example, uh, this roof area here total, I need three number. So I will let you know that actually you need four number downpipe. 
if you don't want to have four number number, you say, hey, James cannot. Uh, my down pipe, I don't have sufficient column to cater for my down pipe, and I don't want to allocate additional column. Fine, fine is uh, is fine with me. But the only thing is, you need increase of your diameter down pipe. Let's say, uh, we propose to you three number of down pipe. Then suddenly you say, uh, uh we propose to three number down pipe in the calculation. Then we add on another additional for backup plan for number. You say the one because too much uh, column you need to create. You will actually block your aesthetic view and everything. So it's fine for me. But the only thing is, we will ask you to increase your down pipe diameter instead of 100, 100 mm or change to 150 mm. That's the reason. Okay. So that's why uh, we we uh, will uh, let you know this kind of information. Okay. So the most important thing for <coughs> for uh metal roof is actually now the days actually uh, the wind quite uh, high speed and actually we we worry on the wind force okay so that's the reason why uh, uh why we actually use uh use actually uh this information data so we have a call we have our own lab in Australia uh NATA test lab okay uh that test actually each of our profile so uh I think in Malaysia. Uh, only Lysat have this lab because uh, this lab actually is accredited by Department of Standard Malaysia. Some of them, uh, some of other people say that oh, wind updates is not important. Malaysia very safe because Malaysia uh, don't have typhoon, okay? Uh, don't have this kind of uh, uh, natural disaster or uh, effect. So uh, please don't assume that, okay? A lot of people say that uh, Sabah don't have earthquake. Suddenly now they have earthquake. So our climate has changed. So we cannot predict what is the uh, uh, what is the future climate change or whether uh, future what is the disaster will come. So that's why uh, please get prepared all this information first before uh, in your design. So reinforce is impo important. You can see a lot of in Clang Valley, even though in Clang Valley, a lot of roof has been blown off. This one on your right side here is actually a Putra Jaya. Putra Jaya just uh, about, I think about eight years back. They just blown off this roof. First of all, uh, of course, you can put uh, put the responsible to the contractor and say that they did it very badly. Okay, but as a designer or as an architect, uh, I think we carry out a responsibility. Even though a uh, manufacturer, we also carry out the responsibility. That's why some of our salesperson or our technical person will ask you, uh, install your roof already or not? Do you need uh, inspection? Do you need uh, our site here to come and inspect the quality of the uh, workmanship? So we offer these kind of uh, services. So please, uh, please do accept these kind of services and say that, hey, yes, come along and uh, inspect for us. In the meantime, you you learn something from there also. So if the uh, if the quality is bad, okay, you know how to rectify it. You know how to issue your AI uh, architect instruction to instruct the contractor to redo certain things. So we came across uh, a lot of designers that take it uh uh. They take it lightly. They say that ah, uh, so it's just a, just a roof. Malaysia will not blow. Uh, will not have a so high wind speed like Vietnam have typhoon and or Thailand or other other country. But yes, I don't deny Malaysia uh, has the lowest wind speed level. But uh, anything can happen. So that's why uh, this is very important just to highlight on that. So uh, we also, as a manufacturer, we also keep on upgrading our knowledge, keep on upgrading our testing. Let's say for example. Uh, we have certain profile we test on 35 meter per second wind speed. So now we actually increase our lab our lab test to 45 meter per second to 50 meter per second. See whether our metal roof can sustain the wind speed that we assume or we uh we predict. Okay, so this is the case you can see the clip here all actually show off. Okay, so this is a cinema roof. So cinema when the wind blow off, okay, blown the roof away. Then you you actually will need to stop your activity below, which is like cinema. You need to close down for a moment. Then we need to continue back. So this is the case happened in Malaysia and another factory also. This is in Johor. Okay. So as you can see here, uh, some of the contractors skip the clips. They thought uh, the clip is uh, not so important. They can skip one number. Then they reduce the thickness of the metal deck. So uh, this is another issue. So uh, we are lucky. Uh, in light side or I mean we have this information, we have this technology. So uh, that's why Department of Standard Malaysia recognize this technology under NATA test. So this is our lab test based on the span 900,000. This is one of our profile, uh, our highest profile for zip deck 
65 mm height. Okay, we send for lab test. Uh, we send not only in Australia. Okay, some profile we done in Australia. Uh, because originally from Australia, some profile we done in Singapore. We call PIC. Okay, and PIC is actually is accredited. It actually is recognized by NATA also. So the only thing is actually uh, uh, one is done in Singapore, one is done in Australia. So basically, this is how the test. So a lot of people ask me, how do you do the wind uplift test? Okay, so basically the only test is actually based on this hotter or this clip. Okay, so we push the airbag, something like an airbag. Okay, we put at the bottom. We put the winds, uh, wind speed criteria or the KPA criteria from the bottom to the top. So we push, push, push until the maximum when this this clip okay, uh, detach from this, uh, this differential detach from the clip, then we call it as a failure already. So even though uh, one clip, we call it fail. That's why you can see unclipping, okay, fail mode. So you will see that, okay, this one based on double span, okay, 900 and 100 spacing, that means the structure span here 900, then 900, okay, uh, center to center 900. And you can see the, the failure is 1.71 kPa, it fails with it. Okay, so anything below than 1.75 is still safe condition. This is based on wind speed uh, 40 meter per second. Okay, so when you can see uh, as you go uh, further and further, okay, uh, like this one, okay, 1.5 spacing, okay, even lower. Okay, because if you go the structure, if the structure goes spacing further apart, the strength of mounting up uh, the the hotter the clip to the roofing sheet is lesser. So that's why you actually weak, weaken up your profile. So that's the reason, okay? So the spacing you put uh, is uh, nearer to each other, the better. So because I say, for example, this one, this Berlin and the other Berlin is uh, 900 or 600. Of course, 600 will be much more better than the 900 spacing. So this is what I mean, okay? So we have this lab to actually test this profile. We have this technology, okay? That's why, uh, some uh, designer they still prefer to light side even though uh light side uh we can say that we keep on upgrading uh what we can give you is actually the information is always updated later i'll share with you some of the information really update i'm sure during your uh i mean part two session when you when you uh, when you learn everything you actually you uh you will actually uh learn about rabbit so uh so learn about rabbit so so when you learn about Revit, we also actually keep on upgrading. We have this Revit software. Okay, so this is the data for other profile like Cape Block. You can see 1.2 spacing, 1.5 spacing. As you go higher and higher, okay, the the pull out, the pull out strength KPA getting smaller and smaller, smaller and smaller. Okay. Okay. So on top of that, we'll give you uh we we'll give you the uh the sorry. The acoustic performance, we have a software. So in your architecture design or your design uh, criteria, every room that you design, you have actually a uh, acoustic performance, like cinema roof, uh, uh, or office, or auditorium hall. So we have actually certain DB requirement. So in your design, let's say, for example, you need uh, auditorium hall you are designing. You need a uh, library. You need 40 DB requirement, okay? So for the roof, Roughly, you need to know how much dB that you need to cut off to get your 40. So basically, uh, layman calculation, outside ambient noise is about 75 to 85 dB. So you use 85 minus 40. So that is the balance of your dB that you need to cut off, STC and cut off. So basically, it depends on your uh, room requirement dB. Okay. So this is the software that we have. Okay. We have you to calculate what is the STC value. This is the double roof system. Okay, even the wall cladding also we are able to do that. Okay. So this is the new uh, regulation, which is the MS1525 standard. So this is a new regulation that set by Malaysia. Uh, every submission or building plan that you submit or doing a uh, submission on your design to all the majlis, uh, whether majlis perbandaran Subang Jaya, majlis perbandaran Johor Bahru, or every, every department of majlis, you need to set a requirement, uh, then have this requirement on the U value, which is according to MS1525. You need to achieve U value 0 0.4. Okay. So basically, uh, what contribute to the U value will be the rock wool and the grass wool and cellulose fiber and some of the other insulation. Okay. So this is one of the requirement. 
is under bylaw. Okay. So rock wool, where you get this data is actually you get from this data. Okay. And grass wool also. Same. Okay. So after that, we actually uh, guide you or give you a, a spreadsheet calculation that we can achieve U value 0 0.3 with this 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 type build up from item number two to item number number seven. Okay. So okay, come to expansion and contraction. Uh sorry a bit noisy here. Uh come to expansion and contraction. Basically, uh eliminate is the highest, steel is the second highest. So basically, uh the every building material we expand contract. Why this one important is actually metal roof, metal roof actually uh, expand and contract to the left and corner. Okay. Uh what I mean is actually from the ridge to the east, okay, the, the expand is actually they pull each other from top and bottom. So the reason why this is important because uh there's a temperature change. Okay. When you daytime uh around like I would say one or two pm, okay, the metal roof degree can go up to 80 degree, 80 degree, then the uh nighttime you can go down to around 30 degrees Celsius. So there's actually temperature change about 50 degrees Celsius. So that when there's a temperature change, the movement of mm is about 12 mm, let's say for 20 meter length of roof. So what it means 12 mm is actually from left and right, okay, top and bottom, it moves 12 mm. So the best profile to choose actually is still keep up because it moves along the tips. Okay. So uh why fastener is not recommended for long land roof is because of the expansion contraction. It cannot be one piece, you need to have lapping and join it. Okay. So okay, so uh I think uh Rocky also have with you on that. Uh, when you use the roof using zinglum or color bond, use back the same materials for flashing capping. Okay, fastener. Uh, as long as whatever fastener you use, no problem. Uh, as long as comply to AS three five six six plus three or plus four fastener. Okay. Uh, or Rocky also a very brief view. Copper lightning resistor is not recommended. Okay, any aluminium. Okay, what is so special uh, than LightSight than others is actually because besides uh, we give our profile technology, uh, be be besides we share our knowledge on our technology of profile performance, we also share about the detailing. I think uh, as an architect or as a designer, detailing is very important. Uh, how you want to finish up your detail, whether for your facial, for your opening and for your so on. So that is very important. So. Uh, during our discussion, we we'll give you sketch up, as uh, uh, sorry, sketch sketch drawing. Okay, from there we will convert into CAD drawing. So this is one example. The the designer want to use mouse steel for this facial. They want to use mouse steel because they look slim and elegant, nice, rigid. Okay, then but at the end due to the cost, when mouse steel is heavier, they actually carry the load of the truss. So alternative solution we are using the flat sheet we bend into the C type. So the design is still able to get the same effect. Okay, instead of using mouse because of candy level about one meter out, so the engineer doesn't allow to use mouse steel because when you use mouse steel, you need you carry this load, you need more member in your truss or structure member to support this outside mouse steel. So we change to the flashing capping, the normal flashing capping, you bend into a C and we still able to get the same effect. So in other way, I can say that we give solution. We are solution provider. We give solution like, for example, uh, QSA increase the trust. Uh, the cost will be uh, raised up. Uh, the engineer say that you need to increase the trust member because you have no choice to hold the uh, the structure support mouse steel at bottom. So the other solution is we give solution is using uh, the flat sheet and we bend it. Then is all party happy? QS able to save cost. Engineer able to perform back. Uh, the trust design as as the normal design. The third one is the designer also happy solve his aesthetic problem. Okay, that is the thing that we actually we not only dealing with one person, we deal with the whole project management team. So basically, the uh on contractor part, we help the contractor to save costs also and developer side. So uh all party benefit everything. So basically, uh we actually one stop solution. Do think about one-stop solution instead of uh, 
just the price only because some people may come uh, come with just a price yes you can have uh, cheaper material this time i can use uh, a lot of cheaper other material but they're unable to solve out the detailing on this information so we actually have our engineer team also to advise whether uh, we can solve the trust problem also okay so for example the, uh, the designer or architect they don't want to use the uh don't want to see the gutter so they want to put a blue nose here so like this kind of blue nose a lot of other manufacturer or other people will say that hey i don't think so i can do that so yes based on the normal flashing flashing capping the the flat sheet cannot bend like that cannot bend one shot because the radius is too small because you're using a uh, very tense uh, steel grade which is g55 g550 steel grade so it's a bit difficult to bend like this so we give another solution for example we ask the designer can i cement the flashing like that one line one line you will see definitely you will see one line one line but from far end you will see a curved bull nose can you accept that or not so when the designer say can then because from far end from the bottom they cannot see much on the roof having this line so they want to have a feature of curving only so we able to curve the radius the smaller radius that they want okay so this is thing so another solution is also like for example like just like i mentioned so uh, this from this height to the bottom height the fascia is too big so when you go for a long length okay you will see waviness so we check with the designer can i recess a little bit and do this kind of flashing for you or not then the designer say no problem as long as i want to uh, look neat and tidy flat so we will we'll provide another detailing on that also so basically um, like I say, detailing is very important because uh, when you come out to the market and you come out to uh, 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 work as a designer, most of the contractors say can, 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 but at the end come to a solution part there at the end say, oh, I cannot be done. I need to add in additional cost to use a higher grade material. So something you actually can be done. It's just that uh, they want to have an easy way out. So uh, they need to seek for advice. They just say, I want to have easy way out. You pay me the money, I can solve this problem. Yeah. So sometimes, uh, as a designer, we need to find more information. We keep on need to update our detailing, our finishing part, so that uh, we able to provide the solution to you. Okay. So another solution is, let's say the roof is so thick. Okay, because I beam is about two hundred fifty mm height. If you add on your Berlin normally standard is hundred fifty, so it's about three to four hundred height. So you need to cover your roof some more. You need to cover your ceiling some more. So your fascia will add up about 500, which is like a factory roof. So it doesn't suit to your uh, residential design. So uh, normally what we advise is we flush the pearly to the I beam so that you can reduce the level of 150. So when you can reduce the level 150, then you can reduce your fascia. So when you can reduce the fascia, your fascia will look slim and elegant. Okay. So like this example, okay. So why the reason why we put Z spacer here is to prevent the flashing will be wavy or unlevel. So that's why we put a flat sheet here. So that we actually when you put the bull nose on top, you actually look flat. Okay. So like I say, uh, we actually give solution on the right on your left side here is an architect sketch drawing. They just give an example uh, what is the sizes and everything, what is the height they want. So from there I we will scratch out, okay, this this is what you want is it so uh then we ask our our i mean drafter uh, or our rabbit team people who draw the 3d perspective uh, to you and you have a rough uh, estimate know that how's the feature looks like okay so another sketch uh, drawing we will sketch out so the uh, uh like they say i need to have a skylight detail here okay so we provide a sketch up okay this is a uh, 3d view there, the roof sloping this side and sloping this side. So after we provide three D view, we will highlight to them the most tedious part is water will bang into this skylight because this skylight normally is upstand. So how you detail out this part? So you know channel what the water amount of water this area down to this area so that it will discharge to your gutter. So it's another. Uh, it's actually a very high risk design if you have a. I mean a, a skylight in the middle like that. So, uh, we came across. This one you need a very experienced uh, contractor to do it so that your water will not seep through this area and seep through this area. For this part, no problem. So we actually asked the designer to change the color at the ratio whether can or not. 
So because this skylight will overlap to the metal that will be easier. Like you do cascading waterfall, like this part, this water actually will slope through here, then down to your this uh this metal deck and down to your gutter. Will be much more easier, it's like cascading waterfall. So uh for this part, definitely the water will actually bang up. This is what we actually will unless you recess this skylight down, okay, here, this area, then but this metal roof you need to uh put it down that uh lower to the this uh, glass roof. So you actually have three types of cascading, one side here down to your glass roof and another side down to your metal deck again. So uh, your level of your choice is like going down and down and down. So uh, we will say that you affect your design aesthetic also. So uh, at the end, the solution is actually she adjust the design up to here and she put, actually pull the whole length of here is glass. So it will be much more easier and you won't create uh, you are uh, not say won't have chances leaking, but the chances of leaking actually lesser. But these chances of leaking, I can say that uh, if the workmanship is bad, uh, 70 to 80 percent you will fuse. Yeah, so if the design is they put this way, okay, I would say that you have to reduce to 30 percent, you to 20 percent, it feels only because of the workmanship. Yeah, so uh, that's the thing, okay. So on top of that, let's say you design a factory or other shopping mall, you need to have used uh, this polycarbonate. We have that. So that's how you can see normally polycarbonate will put at the reach to the if one shot. Either you put half like that, then you let to your metal deck because this one is actually, uh, this translucent sheet is actually a uh, bigger height, bigger head than the metal deck. Okay. So you actually will let over and down or you straight away one piece. Okay, so it same goes to the cladding. Okay, you can see here actually this translucent shape here it actually is actually lap over the uh the clip lock. This one is actually is lap over the trim deck, the profile. So because this head actually is bigger than the the metal deck itself, so that's why they how they lap over. This is the metal deck. Okay, this is the translucent shape. Okay, so. Another solution, okay. Uh, we have like this kind of curvature roof, okay. Some some of the designer want to have curved roof all the way down like that. So we will ask them to use this three sixty C curve. Then after that, followed by the uh all the way down the back the backing behind is actually using the spandex, okay. So we give solution like this gutter. Uh, the width is too big. Okay, we put another layer method that below here to uh to prevent the gutter uneven okay this is one of solution then we provide like batch capping for wall creating these kind of details so we work out detailing to the designer okay it depends on sometimes we don't give uh, uh our standard detail that's why we come to discuss with you what is the uh, right detail to be used uh so that you're able to provide straight away to provide the right tender drawing out okay so like this this is the latest uh, information. Uh, currently, uh, I think CIDB and Bomba has a new requirement. Any cladding that you use uh, above 80 meters, you need to go for Bomba test. So whether on top of to the masonry wall or the drywall system. So this is our cladding. We need to send for testing on the Bomba because of the EPF case burn down, uh, the PU form and everything. So that's why we need to test our wall cladding system. So we have a few tests already tested. So uh, you can ask for us uh, for the you can ask the detailing from us okay so on specification profile uh base steel thickness and material have to be uh, in the specification or in the drawing so profile will affect the costing the thickness also and the material so like rocky say different sites they have a different requirement on the material so different thickness also like i say different thickness have different performance of the profile but every profile have their own characteristic okay like this kind of design Okay, we just only use trim deck. Okay, but we use 0.48 thickness because we want to have actually uh, because if if the steel material use thinner gauge, uh, not to say cannot, it still can be done, but you will see certain waviness. Okay, so we have another uh core structure decking which is our bond deck currently using in K one one eight. This is more to uh structure engineer, so they need to calculate the slab okay with our bond deck together. So basically, whenever steel construction, we will get involved because they need structural decking. The reason why this bonded being used is because 
you have, uh, let's say for example, you have a link bridge. Below is actually heavy traffic. You cannot construct any framework. You need this decking. Sometimes you go past by highway or link bridge. Uh, you look below it. Actually, there's this silver color thing. This is called bond deck. This is to actually cast the slab okay, without any framework below. That means without any supporting uh, framework. Because in heavy traffic, you cannot construct any framework. You have a lot of cars pass by. So you need to have this structure decking. So engineer will design based on the structure design and what is the thickness to be used, what is the slab thickness to be used, all this kind of thing. Okay, this is how it looks like. Okay, sorry. So, yeah. so this is how it looks like without any propping. So you actually eliminate all this form mode, you actually save cost on that, save time also. Okay, so uh, you actually have a clean, this is IBS system, you have actually clean construction site. So fast and easy, reduction of construction time. Basically, it's actually up to two hours for rated for the slab. It is how it looks like. So you install the uh, the structure decking onto the I beam. Then after that, you put one layer of BIC. Then you pour concrete of your slab. Okay. This is how it looks like. So let's say if the this is one layer of BIC. So let's say if the slab loading is too heavy, uh, like for example, like car park area, then uh, you need to put additional BIC on top. Good installation practice for school type. We recommend that the fastener to be fastened to be like that. That is the correct way. Of course, every contractor we cannot uh, control their workmanship because why some is our own obligated, our own contractor, some is not. So as long as they comply this kind of standard, roughly this standard, and don't want to over driven this uh this screw, then will be fine. Okay. So like I say, uh the flashing capping here. We actually cut into the template of the metal deck, then we bend it down. That's the detailing. Okay. Alright, this is the form filler. This is to prevent the wind actually. Let's say you slope this side towards you. Uh to prevent the wind actually blow over and seep through the water seep through. If you have two degree pitch or one degree pitch of design normally. And this one form filler here, it comes with one set. It actually uh to prevent the bird actually entering to the building. For like example, okay, so uh, the first protection will be the flashing. You bend down, cut into the template that just now. Then second protection is the form filler just now. And third protection, by putting this, uh, bending this, uh, your cat drawing up or your rabbit drawing here, bend up like that, the, it will show that contractor need to do this, this thing so that water will not seep through to the, this area here, okay. So these are the few case study. Like I say, uh, we can do uh, wonders of design. Okay, curve on plan. This M marker, uh, Hans Academy. So this is the underliner that install first, then followed by the top skin. So we can do curve on plan, curve in elevation. Depends on what profile to be used. So let's say of uh, let's say this kind of design, we normally will use the premium product because you need to achieve this kind of aesthetic or this kind of view that you want. Okay, sorry. So I like, see you can see this kind of design. Okay, this is the original picture. Okay. So you can see here actually this design taper everything. We use standing seam. So we cannot use the normal clip lock. So that's why by showing us your design, okay, uh, we able to give you a solution. Okay. Uh, some people say that oh you want cheap, you use clip lock, then you will see a lot of flashing capping joining around. Okay. You cannot see one piece so nice like that. So we provide the drawing for the contractor, uh, what kind of radius to be cut and so on. Okay, like this one. How we cut. Okay, where's the radius? Okay, provide detailing also at the wall there and the if there, how we detail out. Okay. What to put. Okay, this is the cat drawing. This now is the sketch drawing. So basically, uh, we provide two. Okay, we have a standard drawing. Uh, we have a, a sketch drawing and we have a cat drawing. So basically, we will we'll go with standard first. Normally, we'll give you the standard drawing. So when you put it, then we think that actually your design need more detail on that. Then we go for sketch. Then after that, we discuss on sketch. After we discuss on sketch, we'll come up with the, I would say that, uh, construction drawing for you or the tender drawing for you so that uh, the contractor will not miss out any item to code. Okay. We put, uh, I mean, we also 
give 3D perspective. Okay. So this is also one of the cladding that we use. So we use it for wall cladding. Okay, one of the, our profile British panel. Okay. Like I say, how we're going to detail out at the apron slab, the blue words opening, window opening. So this are detail. This is a section from the plan view. Okay. This is internal cladding. This is external cladding. So how we detail out every school and everything. We work with a lot of suppliers like DML, Hunter Douglas, others to actually work out the detail together. So for example, this one we are using Hunter Douglas uh, Lewis. Yeah. So like corner capping, how we're going to cap out. Okay. So uh, at the bottom of the Lewis here, how we're going to finish up. Uh, sorry here. Yeah. This part. So at the C here, the C, the section FF here. Okay, how we're going to finish out the detail. The roof part, the EE. So this is the cladding. Oh, sorry. So this is the cladding. Then we cap it. Then here is the roof. Our roof is the gutter. Okay. So now we're actually moving uh, the IT technology. We have our own Revit object now. So uh, you does not need to create any uh, object. We have our own, uh, every profile of our object, you can actually get from us anytime. So we have our own object as each of the profile. So uh, we are moving towards a few more steps uh, beyond that. Uh, we are actually going for system object. That means we are going for acoustic performance proof system. What is the layer inside? What is the build-up system inside? So as we go uh, more and more, we will come up with uh, uh, Bin 360 also. Okay, so you can download our object from our website here anytime. Okay, so basically, I would say that uh, like I said, actually moving uh, forward, we actually uh, moving forward with CIDB uh, with this Revit team. Okay, and uh, we always upgrade our profile. Like I say, uh, the wind uplift testing, we already upgrade to 40 meter per second, 45 meter per second, and now we are trying to go into uh, 50 meter per second because. We are doing regional. We actually uh, cater for Vietnam country also and other country also. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. Any question?